Heavenly Father, we are here again this evening waiting to be fed by you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, in every way, Lord. We know that your word has power, power to change hearts, power to change even situations that seem insurmountable. Help us, Lord, that we will allow your word to have full sway in our minds, to transform and change everything in us and to prepare us. We want to be there on that day when you return. We want to be part of the citizenry of your kingdom. Thank you for the great plans you have for us. Bless us and bless us well, those that will be watching the video afterwards. May your Holy Spirit inspire and teach them as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So tonight we are reviewing the second part, the second half of our memory verses, which begin with Exodus 12, 13. So if we are ready, you can repeat right along as I go through them. Exodus 12, 13, and the blood shall be upon, shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when i smite the land of egypt that was exodus 12 13 which is followed by exodus 28 to 11. remember the sabbath day to keep it holy holy means separate set apart right six days shall thou labor and do all thy work but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, <clears throat> nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or sanctified it. <clears throat> this is followed by Romans 8, 5, 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That was Romans 5, 20 and 21. Then comes Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. What a perfect exchange. And God gave it all, all, didn't hold back anything, gave us it, gave it all to us. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all, with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are transformed or are changed into the same image from glory to to glory even as by the spirit of the lord that was second corinthians 3 18. then comes acts 4 12. neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved only through jesus right that then is followed by Revelation 14, 12. That's a complete transformation of the gospel of Jesus, right? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep or hold on and cherish the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. Then Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly 
at heart. And, uh, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes. He takes the brunt of the weight, right? Then comes the twins, Exodus 33, 14, and Revelation 22, 3 and 4. Exodus 13, 14 says, not 13, 33, 14 says, and he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. The same theme continues there that we just repeated from Matthew, right? In Exodus, that's what God said to the people of Israel, my presence shall go with thee and I will give you rest. You don't have to worry. You don't have to sweat it, right? <clears throat> Revelation 22, 3 and 4. Here is the other promise for the end, right? He's got it all figured out. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be written in their foreheads. Yes, the character of God will be right there. Instituted, established, firm in the mind and heart of every believer that is there on that day, right? Okay, <clears throat> continue to review. And we are ready to go into the lesson tonight. The lesson tonight comes from chapter 42. We are starting chapter 42. It's on page 224. The title of it is The Promises to Israel Again in Captivity. Hmm. This is part one of three. And this was an article written for the present truth of February 18, 1897. And I see now a T, an extra T there. So let me mark it so I can let them know to edit it. All right. We'll begin the reading. <clears throat> Although the children of Israel sang the song of deliverance by the Red Sea, remember we read it and studied it and so forth, okay? And with good reason too, it was not until they had crossed the Jordan that they were really free from Egypt. They did not hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end, but, quote, in their hearts, turned back again into Egypt. How sad. God took them out of Egypt, all the way to the, to the earthly Canaan, but they took Egypt in their hearts. What a horrible, terrible thing. It says there, in their hearts turned back into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. Hadn't God told them, I will go before you? No, that wasn't good enough. Make us gods to go before us. Because this one, we don't know what's happening with him. Now, this comes as a, as a quotation from Acts 7, 39 and 40. However, those words come actually from the Old Testament. And if you don't mind, turning to Exodus 32, Exodus 32, um, actually, let's go to Exodus 24 first, Exodus 24, because after they received the Ten Commandments, spoken by God and written with his finger on tables of stone, we have studied this quite deeply already, but in, so that happened in Exodus 20, right? Let's go to Exodus 24, verse 18. Because after this, then it says there in Exodus 24, 18, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud, right up there, Mount Sinai, where God has spoken from, he went up there into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. 
and Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So it's telling us what's going to be happening. Now, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Those are the chapters there after that. 31. And here we go to chapter 32. And I want us to find out what happens towards the end of those 40 days and 40 nights, nights that Moses went up to the mount into the cloud to speak to the Lord. Or more likely, better said, to hear what the Lord had to say to him. Because remember, that's when he got all the information about this sanctuary. We studied that too, right? How God gave him all the instructions of what, how to make this sanctuary, all of that. And all the other information about sacrifices and about the laws that they needed to follow. Uh, these were moral laws and, and all kinds of other uh, citizen kind of um, help that God was giving them. They needed, it was a nation. They needed rules and statutes in order to know how to behave and how to be fair and just with one another. Here in chapter 32. This is a very sad chapter. It is a sad chapter. Let's begin reading ver with verse 1. We'll go verses 1 to 6. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Aaron was the one that remained there. Aaron was Moses' brother, right? And they said unto him, Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. See, this are the same words that we read there in the book from Acts 7, 7, 39 and 40. Here they are. Make us gods that which will go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what is become of him. Forty days, that's a month and ten days. And that was too long for them. Too long for them to know that uh, what had happened to, to Moses. Oh, they figure maybe that he had died up there. We waited long enough. How long had God already waited? How much had God already done? And yet, what are they doing? They are asking for, an, for a built God. Let's make a God. Is the God that they're going to make, were they thinking, were they listening to what they were saying? Is the God that they're going to make a better leader, a more constant and consistent leader than the God that had brought them out of the land of Egypt with all kinds of miracles and wonders? Ah, oh, we point at them. And three fingers point right back at us, right? Because the very same things that they were guilty of, boy, are we always tempted to do too. Let's continue verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. Verse 4, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, This be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. There's plenty there already. So let's 
let's go and read something about what they were doing there. For this, I will need to share my screen so we can read together and see together. The Golden Calf from Exodus 32. Don't forget where it is. We already went there and read together. Please make sure that you are marking this thing so you know where they are and you can go back and read more about it and so forth. We're going to read a little bit more about, about it, but not everything from the chapter. So here we have. So they rose up. What did they do? It said, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. What kind of playing is it that is going on there? Remember, Aaron has said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord, and they rose up to play, it says there. Okay, let's see. Here we have um, an appendix note to page 316 of Patriarchs and Prophets, and this explains a little bit more of what's going on there. It says the Israelites in their adoration of the golden calf professed to be worshiping God. This is serious. It's even more serious than just the fact that they had made an idol. And maybe they had the idol besides, you know, God. Okay, so they prayed to God and they I mean, not that that is anything that we want to copy. That's not what I'm saying. But here in their adoration of the golden calf, professed to be worshiping God. So far were they deceived by themselves that they could make that switch. No problem. Oh, here's this golden calf. We just worship it as though it is God. And no problem. Let's go right on with life. Thus, I continue reading, those Aaron when inaugurating the worship of the idol proclaimed, tomorrow is a feast unto Jehovah. They proposed to worship God as the Egyptians worshiped Osiris under the semblance of the image. Who is Osiris? It was a major God. This is a, a parenthesis to this. Osiris was a major god in the Egyptian religion, a god of the underworld, fertility, agriculture, and resurrection. Continuing now on the quote that is on the screen, but God could not accept the service though offered in his name the sun god and not jehovah was the real object of their adoration our minds trick us because our minds are very deceitful right the heart is deceitful above all things it says in jeremiah right god warns us that we are very good at deceiving, at lying to ourselves. We are never better at convincing about a lie than when we are convincing ourselves about our own excuses or lies or the things that we want to do. We come up with the idea, we come up with how it is okay and how it is okay with God too, that we are doing what we are doing. So, though offered in his name, the Son God and not Jehovah was the real object of their adoration. Think in your own minds, where could there be something like that in our lives? Where we have come to the place that we accept something that we have known is not right, but we have made it fit to worship God, to say, God is okay with this. It's a very serious thing because this is a matter of life and death. We can deceive ourselves to the extent that we can end up worshiping the devil 
As we are thinking, we are worshiping God because we have rationalized every step of the way until we get there and we are just as sure of that as we were before that we were worshiping God. This is very serious, very dangerous, very, very dangerous. This continues and it says the worship of Apis which was the pagan bull god, was accompanied with the grossest licentiousness. And the scripture record indicates that the calf worship by the Israelites was attended with all the license usual in heathen worship. We read, here comes a little bit of understanding. We read, they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Exodus 32, 6. The Hebrew word rendered to play signifies playing with leaping, singing, and dancing. This dancing, especially among the Egyptians, was sensual and indecent. The word rendered corrupted in the next verse that would be verse 7 it says and i'm reading it from the bible and the lord said unto moses go get thee down for thy people which thou hast brought out of the land of egypt have corrupted themselves <clears throat> interesting they were not corrupted by anybody else no other influences were there it was their own idea, their own mind being corrupted by itself to do the things they were doing. I go back now to the quotation. <clears throat> this dancing, uh, pardon me, the word render corrupted in the next verse, where it is said, thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, is the same word that is used in Genesis 6, 11, and 12, where we read that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. This comes from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 760. So, what we have next, then, let's read back to Exodus chapter 32 and let's read now verses 7 to 9 and the Lord said unto Moses go get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them they have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Stubborn, stubborn, stiff-necked. So this is what now in verses 15 to 19, we're going to read verses 15 to 19 next. This is what Moses sees when he comes down. <clears throat> in verses, by the way, in verses 10 through 14, what you find there is that um, Moses intercedes for the people when God gives, tells him what's going on, that he should go back to the camp and so forth, Moses intercedes for the people, but he is not even ready for what he is going to see, what he's going to find. So let's go to verses 15 to 19. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hands. Remember, tables of the testimony are the tables of the Ten Commandments, which were written with God's finger on tables of stone, which God had provided, by the way, the first set 
just a parenthesis there. Continuing, the tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon tables. Verse 17, and when Joshua, because Joshua had gone up with him, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. This should give us an idea as to what kind of noise was coming from there. He didn't hear a beautiful choir singing, glorifying God. He heard noise of war. That cannot be mixed up with singing. But verse 18, Moses answered and said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Verse 19, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses's anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Let's go back to verse 18. When Joshua thought that he was hearing that there was trouble in the camp like war Moses said, no, that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing noise of them that, that sing. This is a good place for us to examine too. What kind of music do we listen to? What kind of music do we sing? And especially, what kind of music do we sing to the Lord? Because if our singing is going into God's ears like the noise of them that sing instead of the melody of them that sing, then we are actually then presenting the kind of music that is due to heathen gods, gods that wake up the basis of all our emotions and therefore bring from us those things that are not pleasing to God's ears and to God's heart. Music has a lot of influence, a lot of influence. We cannot deny that. I'm sure that we cannot all understand that. Music has a lot of influence on us. Just listen to a, uh, the, the national anthem of any nation. Oh, if, if we are Americans and we hear the national anthem being played or being sung by somebody really well sung, it moves us, doesn't it? Yes, music has a lot of influence on our emotions. And so we need to make sure that we don't allow the worship of Satan to bring in the music of Satan and present it to God and say, here God, you have to take it because this is what I decide to bring. This is a very special way there that we can, we can understand how the, the conversation between Joshua, Joshua and Moses tells us what is it that they were hearing and what the first impression that Joshua had and Moses then declared it to be the noise of them that sing. <clears throat> I think we'll go back now then to our book and uh, we will then continue the reading where we were. We were only on the first five lines right after Acts 7, 39 and 40. When they crossed the Jordan, however, <clears throat> and came into the land of Canaan, they had the testimony from God that the reproach of Egypt was rolled away from them. Then they had rest and were free in the Lord. But 
Ah, too bad that the next paragraph begins with that three-letter word, right? But this freedom was not long retained. Murmuring, distrust, and apostasy soon appeared among God's people. They desired a king that they might be like the heathen about them, and they desire and their desire was granted to the full. They quote mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yeah, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and, their, and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. This is from Psalms 106, verses 35 to 38. Thus they became literally like the heathen around them. Wouldn't it have been better if the heathen had become like the people of Israel instead? Wouldn't it have been just the joy of God's heart to see them, tell the people around them, and teach the people around them so that they are converted to the God, the true God, the Creator God, rather than the whole nation of Israel converting to the gods of the people around them. How, how sad. How very, very, very sad. Please underline the first three lines in the next paragraph. And we'll read that slowly as you do that. A little glance at the history of some of the kings of Israel and Judah will show how completely the children of Israel, in getting a king, had the fulfillment of their wish to be like the heathen. That's where they began, by asking for a king, right? And by the way, when it says the kings of Israel and Judah, remember, Israel and Judah were divided. The, the, the nation of Israel was divided. They actually fought with one another, like a civil war, and they divided. And how, how to know? Okay, the kingdom of the north is Israel. The kingdom, kingdom of the south is Judah. Each one of them had then their own king king for the north and a king for the south. How to remember that? I comes before J, right? So I, Israel, is for the north. Judah, J, is for the south, the southern kingdom. Okay, so as we read here, you have the picture there in your mind. To Saul, the first king, the prophet of God said, quote, Let's go to 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23. It's there, but this is one of those that we should have underlined in our Bibles. 1 Samuel, it's, a, it's, it's not too far from Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, then comes 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. So this is already... God dealing with the very first one of the kings that they requested and God eventually had to give it to them because that's all that they wanted. Okay, 15, 22, and 23. And Samuel, this was the prophet of God, said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken or to listen is better than the fat of rams. See, because they got to the place where we do whatever we want, as long as we just take the offering, take the sacrifice, and we offer this ram and this she sheep and this lamb and this cow and this heifer, and on and on and on, the... the, the um, the blood was running everywhere and they were doing whatever they wanted. All that, we, God is happy with us because we're doing all of those things. But we're not paying attention to them, we're not, to him, we're not obeying him. We're not listening to him. 
but that's okay because we have the sacrifices. Then see what he says in 23. For rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, worshiping idols. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. These are, these are the words of God through prophet Samuel to King Saul, the very first king of Israel. At this time, they were all together. It was one nation. They had not divided yet. How sad. How quickly God told them. Kings are going to be bring problem. Oh, they are finding out. But they are right along with that too. That's the sad part. Okay, so let's go to the next paragraph. Solomon, continuing the history, took many strange wives, strange meaning foreign wives, from among the heathen. And let's read that. First Kings 11. So keep on 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and then 1 Kings. 1 Kings verse 11, verses 4 and 5. Now, this was Solomon. Solomon was the son of King David. Solomon is, is very famous for being so wise, right? Wise like no other man on earth. Very good. Let's see how this wise person who knew so much because he got the wisdom from God, but then he changed the wisdom to his own. 1 Kings 11, 4 and 5. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives, all the wives that he had married, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Malcolm, the abomination of the Ammonites. And verse 6, let's read that too. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did his father. King David. How sad. How very sad. He had a father that was very much in, in tune with God. Yes, he had his problems, right? But he had the example of his father in dealing with God. And he had started, Solomon had started asking God, would you lead me? Would you guide me? I don't know what to do. I am, I am like a child. And God said, okay, ask whatever you want. He said, I want wisdom. But wisdom is not enough if the God of wisdom is not allowed to be in control of our hearts. We see the, the example right there. All right, let's go up to page 225. Under Rehoboam, Solomon's son now, quote, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves. Now it says groves there. It has a footnote that goes below. Actually, the word is Asherah. Let's go to the bottom of the page to see what Asherah is all about. The word groves in this and the following text is a very unfortunate, misleading rendering of the original. The revision has Asherah, not Asherah, pardon me, Asherah. As we can see by carefully noting the use of the term, it cannot mean a grove of trees, since we read of groves being set up under every green tree and in the house of the Lord. So it cannot be because they were not putting trees under the groves, right? Continuing now, the thing itself, in other words, Asherah, was an obscene 
image pertaining to the lascivious rites of one form of sun worship. So this is what this next king, the son of King Solomon, did, right? Go, going back to the top of the page, they put an Asherah, one of those images, obscene images, on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. That is from 1 Kings 14, 22 to 24. The same thing is recorded of Ahaz. He comes another king. That's from 2 Kings 16, 1 to 4. And although, quote, the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. So here, Judah and Israel are, are already divided, right? The kingdom has been divided into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. Yet... In the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. Now, the, the people of Damascus had already come against him, and he had lost the battle. But he sacrificed to the, to the gods of Damascus. Why? He said, because the God, so the kings of Assyria help them to win over us, in other words. Therefore, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. How deceived can you be to think that twisted way? Why were they losing? Not because God was not hearing them. The true God was not hearing them. Not because the true God did not have the power, but because they had already chosen to worship those gods. So they already left God out of the equation. God wanted to. Of course, can we understand that? Of course, God is watching all of this and he's wanting to get them back. And he sends one prophet after another, after another, after another to help them see the way that they're going. And they are, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't like what that prophet says. Put him in a, in a cistern with water and mud right up to his, uh, up to his waist and leave him there without food or anything. That's what they did to Jeremiah. And what would they call? They would call other prophets, false prophets. But they would call them and say, what do you have to say from the Lord? Oh, no, the Lord says that nothing is going to happen to you. There's not going to be any captivity. There's not going to be anything. No, everything is hunky-dory here. Oh, this one, give him prices. Give him all kinds of rewards. Because this one tells us what we want to hear. Is your heart... Is your, is your heart sad yet for God? That's from Second Chronicles 28, 19 to 23. There is so much more about that. We will continue next time. I want us to close. I want us to close with words of people that did not follow their deceitful hearts. Let's go to Joshua. Joshua, back up, right? Back up to Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. At this time, Joshua was dealing again with how people were choosing other gods. And Joshua comes up and valiantly stands up for God. And as we hear the words of Joshua on Joshua 24, 15, I want us to hear them spoken to us. And let's take the suggestion of Joshua. Let's take God's side. What say you? 24.15. And if seem... Uh, Joshua is already speaking, so it's a, it's a long uh, speech. But here is sp this part in verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, on the other side of the river, on the other side of Jordan, 
or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There are all kinds of gods waiting to be served out there. All kinds of invitations to worship all kinds of gods. Sometimes we bring them into our homes, ourselves, right? And we spend more time with them than we spend with the Word of God. And we st spend our money on them instead of spending the money for the work of God. And on and on. We need to stand up as parents, as spouses, as maybe leaders in our church and say, it's time to decide. Are we going to serve those other gods or are we going to serve the Creator God? And say like Joshua, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May that be the decision on every heart, that God's heart may be joyful as he sees what, what our decision is for him. Let's kneel then as we close with prayer. Heavenly Father, at different times and in different ways, we have served other gods, heathen gods, gods that take us away from you, gods that make us feel good about ourselves, but not in the right way. Gods that blind our eyes and our minds to righteousness, to right doing, to your righteousness, to your blessings, to your leading in our lives, to everything that you have done for us and are doing for us and want to do for us yet. Forgive us. Forgive our rebellious hearts and grant us, Father, the desire and the willingness to surrender and say with Joshua, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, not because of our own strength, no, but we will receive with joy the promise that we already have heard before. It is God who gives us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And may we want no one else's will, not one else's doing, but yours. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.